but much more importantly, what are they going to do tomorrow which is different from what they were doing three days back? It's about the future. It's about not only about what they have learned here, but it's about what they commit themselves to do in future as individuals, but much more also as organizations. So that's what the last session is about. But after the people who are on the stage, we are also going to ask uh, some other people who have actually volunteered themselves to very briefly describe what their commitments are, again, as individuals and also as organizations. And then we will open up to anybody of you who would like to very briefly uh, describe what you will do different tomorrow compared to three days back. Is that OK? And we are still going to finish by hopefully 4.15. Let's see how it goes. <laughs> My own experience of uh, this conference has been extremely positive. And I remember uh, talking uh, in year and a half back, or it might be even earlier, to Ken here and Jeff sitting right here, to say we should do something about this. And they were uh, very enthusiastic. In fact, it was supposed to be organized earlier in the spring of uh, 2018, but it did get organized. And I, I really want to thank them and also to Pauline who got into the act for doing this so well and so successfully. Of course, then other organizations joined in, and it was all for the good of this conference. We were initially thinking of about 40, 50 people, and I'm told that we have 277 people who joined. Pauline was staring her hairs to say, I have, a, I have a venue, but now I need the numbers, and the numbers <laughs> are becoming so high. So thank you for all of you who uh, heard about this conference, who decided to join, and who actually joined and are here. The strength of this movement is all of you who feel passionately about it, who are willing to spend your time, in most cases money, in being here, either to represent your organization or just to represent yourself. And that is really the strength of this kind of movement. And I feel we are going from a theme to a conference to a movement. That's what we need here. Uh, again, thanking the sponsors, but also thanking the, the funders who have made this uh, conference possible. Let's go on to see what are the key messages and what are the commitments that we make from this conference and converting this, as I was saying, into a movement which will achieve all the things that we have heard in the last two and a half days. We have heard a lot. We have the knowledge, we need to convert it. We have heard from many participants very clear recommendations, very clear messages. We have uh, seen the launch of the WHO guidelines and we have, we have heard some very inspirational talks. Let's see what, uh, what are the next steps. But before I uh, invite my panel members to answer these questions, I would just like to mention one more thing. The, uh, the participation of people with lived experience has been phenomenal. And I really want to pay my appreciation, pay my respects to them to have come out. It's not very easy in many cases to come out with their own stories, but they've done it very courageously, very generously. And this is again something that is going to guide us in future. And this conference has been very exceptional in having a very high uh, proportion of people who have lived experience and, and giving them the floor to share their experience in such a way that we all benefit and we all get inspired by. So a, a round of applause for people with lived experience. <laughs> so Ken, you represent Fountain House here and you decided to take the plunge and said, we are going to do it. And now you have done it. I want to hear from you as to what you see 
uh, Fountain House doing in the, in the coming months and years to lead, as you have done for this conference, this kind of uh, movement? Ken, please. So um, I have a, some points that I wrote down so that I would know what I wanted to say. But um, beforehand, I just want to say a lot of people have complimented me about this uh, or conference, but it really doesn't belong to me. Um, when people said, was, was I worried about this, um, I said uh, no, because I had two of the best organizers in the world working. Um, and that's uh, Jeff and Pauline. And so the rest of it was kind of easy, actually, from my perspective. I, I think that they just they make these things look easy when they're really very, very difficult. So I think it's great. Thank you very much. So when, when, we, when we started down this road, I think uh, with Shekhar and WHO and our other partners, you know, um, we were pretty clear about one thing, that we, we were very much committed to focusing on people with serious mental illness, and that that is a commitment that Fountain House has had uh, throughout its history and will continue to be, and I think that it was, it, it's hard sometimes when you're in the field of mental health and you're in health, econ health economics or in other places to come, come down to this particular what's group of people. But I believe very strongly that it is this group of people who are the people who are the ones who need the help the most and should be the first people we help and not always not help because it's hard. I think that they are the best people to help. I will tell you one story because it's related directly to this conference. So we had a little problem in the van pickup for the equipment going back to Fountain House. The, drive, well, the first driver phased out. So I just was on the phone with um, my office where a member answers my phone. And for the people here who know Jonathan, it was Jonathan. And I was arranging with Jonathan to find the driver, Ben, to come over here and drive it over. So at Fountain House, we actually live the experience, let me just say, on a daily basis. The good news is Ben's going to get here. Um, uh, so the other commitment I think I want to make is that we are going to, through our Center for Leadership and Education, commit to training people around the world interested in our approach. Um, and if I be so bold, I think I would engage our group from Clubhouse International in that particular commitment. Um, we have the capacity to develop model programs around the world. Um, we commit to being a resource to health ministries and governments and to introduce community-based mental health as a cost-effective solution. We commit to being part of these global health summits where we share our approach with stakeholders. And my board chair would want me to say we probably won't pay for it all, but um, <laughs> next time. But um, I think it's great. <laughs> um, and so those are, those are the commitments that we make, um, and, and that we believe very strongly that if we can help people create community-based programs for people with serious mental health issues in the world, uh, the world will be a better place. Thank you very much, Ken. And uh, let me assure you, when you uh, take action to realize these commitments, you're not alone. These people are all with you. Yeah. Thank you. We go on to Kathy Pike, who, uh, as a part of the Global Mental Health uh, at Columbia, has supported this uh, uh, almost right from the inception and has put in a lot of scientific rigor, but also her uh, network, a very wide network of people who have worked on this. Kathy, it's been a pleasure to work with you, but thanks. what I want to ask you now is, what next from your side? Okay, thanks, Shekhar. Uh, it's been a pleasure working on this uh, conference, and I think for all of us, it's evolved in what we thought we could achieve, and uh, it's just wonderful to be at this moment. 
uh, I have a couple of reflections. One is uh, at Columbia, I have the good fortune of a network of colleagues working in global mental health who are just extraordinary. And uh, one of the things that has been critical to our efforts in global mental health has been around supporting the WHO ICD-11 work with and serving as the data coordinating center and the hub for building an online platform of clinicians around the world. This network now has 15,000 clinicians who have been part of providing input to the ICD-11 guidelines that will be essential to all of us as we think about how we talk about mental illness going forward, mental disorders going forward. That platform, we are committed to taking that platform forward as a training platform, first around the ICD-11, but then beyond. How do we engage with all of the stakeholders here to understand what are the priorities in capacity building that we can contribute to by continuing to build the mental health professionals around the world. We talk a lot about building the workforce with the, and extending the workforce with the non-professional, non-professionally trained um, uh, community health workers who are ex es essential. Uh, but essential to their success will be having leaders uh, in their region who are local, who know their language, know their needs, know their country. And so we think that our one of the things that we can contribute to, uh, given that we have this platform of over 15,000 clinicians that continues to grow, is um, working with people around those training priorities. So that is um, one of the uh, priorities that we will set on our agenda as a uh, part of our terms of reference as we move forward with our, uh, as a collaborating center. And, and related to that, we think it's so important that this is a, a clinical practice network. So we have immediately closed the gap between research and clinicians. As we gather data, we're gathering data from clinicians and it's going back to clinicians. And so that 17 year gap that haunts the researchers and the clinicians is closed in this network. So that's one thing that we are committed to taking forward. The second is that we uh, at our program are passionate about training. And uh, Dr. Milton Weinberg uh, runs the T32 uh, training pr uh, program in global mental health implementation science. We have a global mental health scholars program through our WHO collaborating center. We have a summer internship program for college students. Uh, and we'd like to continue to think about how do we expand the communities that we um, work with in terms of training. And uh, third, uh, we are committed to working with the Kennedy Forum and uh, and our local is the United States around these policy issues and serving as a partner with the Kennedy Forum in the global local partnership around how do we make sure that what we're learning uh, has, is heard uh, on a policy, at a policy level and specifically with Amy Kennedy who spoke today around potential opportunities uh, in working with city and state governments around school curricula in mental health. Um, one wish that I have uh, when we convene again, I don't know if it will take, it'll take much more than one year, but maybe in five years, one wish that I have for our field is that we, because I think how we talk about our work matters, uh, I would love to stop talking about mental health and physical health. Uh, mental health and other health conditions uh, make a whole person. And I think as long as we continue to talk about mental health as if it's not physical health, it continues to put mental health in this othering position and in the ethernet in a way that makes it not real. 
it's a really great shorthand. Everyone understands it, but I think it has uh, a cost. And so that's one of my wishes for our field. Thank you very much, Kathy. Uh, uh, very clear, uh, very specific, uh, and very ambitious. So let's see what we can do. Uh, we go on now to Grand Challenges Canada. Uh, Shane Green is representing them. And uh, they have been involved, uh, again, for a very long time. And given that uh, they are all about innovations, it is extremely important and very useful that they joined in, in the organization and in the preparation of the scientific program. So Shane, I know that you are not the CEO, but what are you allowed to say here? <laughs> <laughs> what am I allowed to say here? Um, let, let, me, let me start with a few things. Um, my, a member of my team, Ellen Morgan, who was the, um, the, the, the lead of our mental health program until she moved on about a year ago from GCC uh, to have her beautiful daughter. Um, as she's leaving, she said to me, okay, one of the things you're gonna have to pick up for me now that I'm leaving is you're gonna have to pick up this fountain house thing. I'm like, what is this fountain house thing? Did it serve soda? I, mean, no, I, I have no idea, I am horrified now that I didn't understand, I didn't know. And now I will not forget. Mm -hmm. So that's lesson one for me is the remarkable work that you all are doing. Um, the similarities we see to some of the other programs that we've seen and that we laud as really amazing you know, examples of success. And yet there's one right here, an hour and a half flight from Toronto, which is amazing. Um, it's also been great to, as Devorah said, you know, th these are a bit of family reunions sometimes for the gold mental health community. Um, but it still it does keep expanding. Uh, and we, we see more people, we see more people uh, coming together, um, perhaps don't brand themselves as global mental health. John from Sacramento talking about some of the things that he's learned. Uh, John Belkin talking about what he's learned and is picking up and bringing into New York City. Um, I mean, I think that's, that's been really remarkable for me as well, just how this kind of community can, can broaden uh, all of our horizons. Uh, whether global health is, is your thing or not. So I, I think that's been tremendous. Commitment, and what can I say, which is what Shaker is getting at. Um, I'm actually going to go back. Can you, you can hear me, right? I never got mic'd, but my wife says I don't have an indoor voice, so I don't think I need one. Yeah, yeah good. All right, thanks, Ginger. Okay, so, not good. Um, I, I want to pick up the way, the way Kathy just framed it around Siloing mental health and other health puts it in an othering position. That can be advantageous if as a funder you say, we want to have a concerted program that is focused on mental health and that's tremendous and off we go and that's what GCC has done. What it means though is as government's priority shift, as funders and partners priority shift, by doing that, putting it in that othering position, you can actually leave it aside. And so, we, most of our active funding at, Globe, at the Grand Challenge Canada is in maternal, newborn, and child health. Show of hands, who does not think that should include mental health? Exactly. And yet, it is in this othering position where the focus of our funding right now means that our support of mental health is largely limited to things that very obviously, defensively overlap with maternal, newborn, and child health. Maternal depression. Um, mental health of adolescent girls at the intersection with sexual and reproductive health and rights. These sorts of things we're proud to support. We're, we're gonna continue to support. Some other uh, innovations and interventions where there's a, there's a need to scale up what works and the GCC is really well positioned to help do that. Um, we don't currently have active funding to support that. So what do we have? We have a couple of things. We have an amazingly robust partner network that we continue to work with. Uh, it's always a pleasure for me to, to see and interact with them um, and to see that broaden out. Um, so we're gonna continue to do that. That's commitment one is work with our partners to say, what can we do? We may not be able to have dollars. What can we do? What can we do to link you to Sumitra, to, to Lakshmi, to Joyce, to others that we have supported so that you can understand what they're doing and then help you know, help, help to, to, to disseminate that, that kind of work. Um, 
But we're also continuing to work with our government partners within the government of Canada, both within the international development branch and our domestic uh, branch, where Canada, mental health is a domestic priority. And yet that's one pot of money. International development, another pot of money. We're trying to get them to speak and to share. And by the way, share and send it our way. And then we can keep doing some great things. So that's number one that we're gonna keep doing. Um, number two is, is really to keep working with the government to, to ensure that it remains a part of the development agenda. That it is understood that there is no health without mental health. But I love the way, I saw a tweet from, from Pamela, a, a, I don't know, a few weeks ago, maybe with the, with the London meeting, that essentially framed it more as there's no development without mental health. I thought that's the ticket. That's what we need our partners within Global Affairs Canada to really absorb and understand. Because that's true. And if we want to meet our goals, our sustainable development goals, you cannot do that without more attention to mental health. We can't do it with more innovation in mental health and scaling up what we know works. Uh, the final thing I would say, because Sheikh, are you, um, whether you mentioned or not, invited us to reflect as, as, as people, not just representatives of organizations. Um, I come to mental health first as a, you know, as a recovering molecular biologist back in the day that was totally unrelated to mental health. But I come primarily to mental health as someone living with depression and anxiety. That's one experience. Um, coming to meetings like this, hearing from Ellen, hearing from Betty, hearing from others, people that contributed to the panel discussion we had earlier today, is really enriching. And I just want to say I'm really grateful for that and will do what I can um, to live differently, uh, to, to live differently with that enhanced understanding um, and, and be a, a champion and an ally. So, that's me. Thank you very much, uh, Shane, for putting forward the organizational but also your uh, personal commitments uh, to this. Uh, I must say that uh, most of you will know, perhaps uh, some of them you may not know, that uh, Grand Challenges Canada has supported global mental health for a long time, put in about more than 40 million Canadian dollars into it in the last seven years, and has supported some, how many, 70, 80, more than 80. projects yeah. uh, globally. So they, they are a big player, and I do hope very much, just like you do, that you are able to move the Canadian developmental agencies to really take this seriously, as seriously uh, internationally as they take domestically. And I know that your prime minister is, has personally talked about mental health. So uh, good luck with that. And again, you're not alone. We are all with you on that. Thank you. Thank you. Moitri Sinha. CEO of Cities Rise. This is uh, a relatively younger organization and also involved with younger people. What is uh, your commitment as you go in the future? And you are the CEO. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Shekhar. Um, I think, you know, first of all, a little bit similar to Shane. Uh, we had found all this amazing work that was happening in so many different parts of the world. And then sometime last year, a few blocks down, New York City, and then met Jeff. And I think right from that very beginning, there was such strong alignment in the fundamental ethos and what we care about that even though, as uh, Shekhar mentioned, that we are relatively a younger organization, we were like, no, we are fully in. This is such an important issue. And we've met on weekends, and we've worked really, really hard on, on a number of different things. And I actually would like to thank Jamie Lepine sitting here, who's done a lot of the hard work for uh, the Cities Rise team. <laughs> Supported both Shane and me. Um, but um, I just wanted to share uh, that there were a few principles that right from the very beginning, that we were extremely committed to as we were thinking about designing the program and what it means and also in terms of what it means going forward. One was making sure that the voices of people with lived experience and you know, that's something that, that we bring and make it front and center, not just the conference, but anything that we do. The second was that we spent a lot of time making sure that we get uh, 
um, key, you know, uh, partners from all over the world, as much of different representation. So we really try to make sure that that this is as much about um, you know people on the ground who are actually doing the work. Um, and I think everything in terms of where we go from here continues to be committed towards that. I think the voices of young people is something that we said that, you know, given that a serious uh, mental illness uh, onsets early, that, that that's something that we must uh, commit to. And we were very committed to sort of practical action. We said that, that this conference must feel different from many other conferences from the perspective that we end the conference with what are things that we would all commit to be doing. And I think what has been wonderful over the course of one last year, you know, all of last year towards preparing for this conference was actually the deepening of relationships with Shane, Grand Challenges, with Fountain House, with Kathy, with you, Shekhar, and, and so many others who've been helping. So I think the first commitment that um, in terms of what uh, we were not necessarily focusing on as much in terms of what we continue to do going forward is make sure that we, this, uh, you know, our, um, this close collaboration that we had started doesn't end just at this conference. So making sure that we continue to meet to see what we do with Fountain House. I think right after this we are meeting with Shane to go through the go through the GCC, you know, this portfolio of innovations to kind of see where is it that all the cities and the countries we are working in, where is you know a better sort of that demand supply type of a matching. So we'll get working on that right away and look at uh, serious mental illness as a key area of commitment, which uh, is not something we necessarily had uh, as much of a focus earlier. I think uh, another commitment is that um, we've been focusing on the first four countries that we are working in and the first five cities, but as we heard through the last couple of days, we want to make sure that as we move forward that we don't lose the engagement with Nagpur, Kigali, New York City, especially in the area of serious mental illness where there's a lot of uh, uh, important work going on that, that we find ways that where while we continue to focus on certain areas that we, we continue to have you know, the, the learning exchanges and ways of supporting each other. So that, that's something that I would like to commit to do. Um, the area of youth leadership, so you know, um, that's central to our pillar um, of uh, you know, core of what we are doing. But uh, again, I think as a result of, of um, this conference, I think having a more targeted focus on uh, serious mental illness, some of the work that Kelly and others spoke so about very eloquently, how do we help actually bring the capacity and the training and everything that young leaders need? So one of the key action items is figuring out who we would partner with for you know, building that kind of capacity building for young leaders. And then finally, I think um, uh, another commitment is that uh, we've been looking into how we can build out technology um, as a way to accelerate access to care but also as a way to build some of the infrastructure that communities and cities need in terms of uh, um, analytics, in terms of training infrastructure. So as we build out those infrastructure, making sure that we find a way to um, focus on the needs of people with uh, serious mental illness, that would be the other commitment that I would like to make. So thank you so much. I, it was um, such a privilege and a pleasure to work with all of you and to be with you all the last couple of days. So uh, truly look forward to working with you all going forward. Thank you very much, Moetri. That's uh, very much appreciated and it has been lovely to work with you and I'm sure many of us in this room uh, are very, very keen to continue to work with you and support the work that you're doing. That's excellent. We go on to Deborah Kestel, who is the director designate for uh, the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse at WHO Geneva. 
WHO has uh, supported this conference uh, technically and has launched the formal guidelines. In a way, uh, uh, Deborah, me asking you a question is a little bit unfair because I know <laughs> that you haven't even taken charge of your new position. Uh, but I will still ask that question and I'll not uh, uh, write it down and count it against you if that doesn't happen. But uh, what next from WHO's side? Again, no pressure on you. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, I think that uh, I, I was smiling when you began, uh, Shekhar, because you said, what will you do differently tomorrow? And I'm going to change house, country, <laughs> office. <laughs> <laughs> I'm moving from 48 countries and territories to 194. I mean, uh, everything is going to be different uh, for me in the coming uh, weeks, uh, months, and hopefully years. I think that one of the uh, commitments, of course, we have is uh, to follow up the ongoing commitment that brought us to this point, and is the guidelines were uh, prepared. Uh, I think it was again Vikram yesterday saying uh, why we need guidelines, because uh, if we wouldn't need those kind of uh, reinforcing the need of uh, the linkages between uh, physical, mental health, and the people with uh, severe mental disorders dying early, if that wasn't the case, we wouldn't need guidelines. But because we have to deal with that, we have the guidelines. We also know very well that a piece of paper is just that, a piece of paper, nice guidelines that now and then somebody will Google and will say, oh, look at that, there are some guidelines, let me look at. Most probably will be people, those will be people from uh, the academia that are the ones who do that and, and, and look for information and, and make good use of that. It will be hardly done by uh, the single person in a Ministry of Health somewhere that wants to change things. So what we are gonna do next is to, first of all, disseminate those guidelines among our uh, member states, our, our, uh, among the countries in, in the world, but also we are committed to uh, make them, again, implementable. How do we make sure that those guidelines are used and it's not just, uh, again, a copy received and placed in, in some shelf? So I think that's the, the first uh, commitment, that is we will follow up the process to uh, make uh, sure as much as we can that the, the, the guidelines are going to be used and then we will measure the impact of that implementation to see how we improve uh, or what else needs to be done. We will also do some uh, up updates to existing guidelines. Uh, it was Tarun yesterday asking uh, about the image gap. Many, many of you know it. We are, it is being used uh, uh, in many, many countries, so we need to ensure that it's updated with these new uh, tools, and we will keep working on the issues that are not included in the guidelines, but hopefully with new evidence we will have the possibility to include them. Then, uh, um, a, a, a next, uh, a, another commitment is going to be around what I said before, what it is that we as WHO can do in order to make those things happen, not just around the guidelines, but around the need of uh, people with severe mental disorders and beyond. And don't take me wrong, I love meeting you now and, and, then, and again and again, but as you said, we need to make that network larger every time. And I think that the commitment is, is there. We will do our best to make that happen. We have the capacity uh, uh, to, to uh, uh, the capacity actually to know what is happening in most countries of the world and we need to make good use of that and, and be sure that we um, have the capacity to also to, to have an impact to, to have an incidence on those uh, realities. Uh, I will also, and this is my last one, I think, um, knock on everybody's door uh, of those that have been here and uh, everybody who will, um, I will recall or have the contact with uh, to, to see then how do we continue and how and, and what we do together. How do we continue this path that I think is uh, um, Amazing, challenging, with a lot of great things done, but when we have, when, where we have still a lot to do. So it is, I take the responsibility to knock on doors and to invite everybody to uh, continue this adventure together. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Deborah. Thank you for uh, giving us some ideas about what uh, WHO will be doing. And I can tell you from personal experience, WHO has a tremendous convening power, as you know, and uh, knocking at the doors is a very good term of reference for the director's position. <laughs> And I'm sure you will do it well, and there are many people here who will be supporting you all throughout. Uh, it's important that, as Deborah mentioned, and, and uh, yesterday Tarun was also hinting at that, that uh, the global mental health is, in a way, uh, advancing uh, much more rapidly uh, in the last couple of years than it has done earlier. And we see a lot of... Uh, uh, very high level of uh, interest and commitment by countries and their governments themselves. Uh, for example, the UK uh, first ministerial summit organized in October. Before that, in the World Health Assembly, there was a separate uh, movement on having champions for uh, mental health uh, led by Canada, UK, and Australia. Uh, the fact that uh, the United Nations Gen uh, Secretary General is himself and personally involved in that and has called separate uh, uh, fora for discussion, discussing this uh, thing. The World Bank organized uh, in, in 2016 a separate event on mental health and the World Bank president has gone on record to say that mental health is extremely important for development agenda. The fact that uh, the human capital uh, index and human capital project is being led by by the World Bank. Uh, you know that's quite quite significant thing because World Bank has talked about the value of money for 60, 70 years, and now they're talking about the value of people. That's a significant difference, and mental health tags directly onto that. You know, some countries may not be rich in dollars, but those countries may be very rich on the human capital that they have. And if they preserve it, if they protect it, if they nurture it, they have a very high chance of overtaking some of the other countries which are rich by dollars. So those are the issues which are coming up on the international discussion, which are extremely gratifying for some of the people who have been struggling with this for a long time, because there is a much wider audience now. There is a much wider movement. My worry is, that as mental health advances, the people with severe mental illness are again going to be forgotten, which has happened in the past, and it must not be allowed to happen. So I, just like the, the other five people on the stage, look forward to working with you to see to it that that neglect does not continue. The people with severe mental disorders who require much more help, much more, uh, a partnership then compared to some other people are not forgotten as the global mental health agenda advances. So that's something that we need to keep in mind. Let me not speak too much. Let's go on to some of the other people. So thank you very much. All five of you have making very good, very specific commitments. There are some other people who have volunteered to speak to talk about their own commitments. And this list is not organized in any any logical ways, just by, by the collection of names as they came in. So the first one is Rachel Martin from Born This Way Foundation. Rachel, are you here? If you are, there are two mics on these sides. Please uh, take the floor and tell us what your commitment is. Uh, so, uh, in addition to learning how to correctly press buttons, uh, our big commitment for next year uh, is focused on expanding access to resources for young people. Uh, so, like we discussed earlier uh, in the day, though, during the, the youth panel, uh, we want to make sure that we don't uh, do that in a way that is, one, duplicative of what's already going on, or two, uh, top-down uh, and um, ignorant of what young people are actually looking for in terms of resources. Uh, so we want to make sure that we are 
uh, actually factoring in what young people are telling us about what they need, what they want uh, to both address their immediate mental health needs, but also in order to build uh, robust, thriving, healthy communities that they feel genuinely a part of. Uh, and we hope to do that with many of you here in the room. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rachel. Uh, Tasneem Raja from the Tata Trusts in India. Are you here? Thank you. Makes it easier. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, Tata Trust, being the oldest organization um, in in India and one that funded mental health way before mental health became fashionable, uh, continues to ensure that it is committed to mental health. And in that, it is committed to, to serious mental illness uh, because that has been a trajectory of work that we have been involved with continuously. Uh, so that's, that's definitely a commitment that Tata Trust has. It's evidenced by its latest um, programs beginning with Nagpur. That is just the beginning. And uh, we hope to expand this where we are taking knowledge that comes out of RCTs and innovations into scaled uh, implementation. So that's definitely a commitment. And on the personal front, it's definitely a commitment to ensure that mental health remains an important agenda within uh, the Tata Trust and also within the philanthropies uh, in the Indian scenario. Thank you very much, Asneem. India is a big country. The needs are very high, and, and the resources that the government sector has either are not sufficient or not utilized properly. So the civil society, including foundations like yours, has a very big responsibility. So thank you for committing yourself and the organization for doing that. Uh, my friend Patricio Marquez from World Bank. Patricio. Thanks, uh, Shekhar, and uh, certainly I wish you the best in, you, in the next chapter of your life. And I, I do believe that you will continue to be an active member in different perspectives from your new position. And certainly I would like to use this opportunity to wish the best to Deborah in assuming a major responsibility, and I guess you will have the uh, and the major responsibility is related to filling some big shoes that are left by our colleague uh, Shekhar. Having said that, I think that I would like to take two points that were mentioned. First of all, Shekhar talked about the Human Capital Index. The Human Capital Index, colleagues, was launched last, uh, at the beginning of October during the annual meetings of the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund that were held in Bali and in Indonesia. And this index ranks countries according to the accumulated human capital. And some countries were not happy mainly because some countries were ranked 57, other countries were ranked 75, and certainly some of them said, well, I, we don't believe the numbers. You don't take into account recent investments. Anyway, uh, the whole thing is to, uh, behind the index is to motivate countries to invest in people in order to foster the conditions for prosperity, inclusiveness, and wealth in the 21st century. So what's the story uh, behind the Human Capital Index? The, it's very simple. It's how much human capital a person born today will acquire by the age of 18, given the prevailing health and educational uh, pre given the prevailing poor, uh, risks to poor health and poor education prevailing in their countries where she or he lives. So that's the basic story. So the key ingredients of that index 
are survival, education, and health. So our commitment within that context, and we already have 30 countries that have, survived, uh, have volunteered to be part of that human capital program with the goal of increasing their performance, hence the, uh, the ratings positions, is to make mental health an integral part of those two, uh, three essential uh, dimensions. Survival, education, and health. And I would like to stress what Cathy said, that in pushing forward this integration, uh, this, this, uh, this integration proposition, the goal is to, once and for all, eliminate a false dichotomy between mental and physical health. So, in order to realize that promise, we have se uh, several instruments. One is our commitment and the funding that we are providing to achieve universal health coverage. So, mental health parity has to be an integral part of the progressive realization of universal health coverage. Mental health and mental wellness has to be a critical investment in education in order to, to provide the skills, the knowledge, the capacities, the resilience to enter into the labor force. And certainly, it has to be part of the jobs agenda. Because if you create human capital, and you, if you cannot deploy the human capital for societal benefit, then it's a wasted investment. <coughs> so that will be our commitment, is how to make this as part of mental health, mental wellness, uh, an integral part of this multi-sectoral effort to invest in the new generation, in, to invest in the human capital that countries will need in order to prosper, develop, compete in the 21st century. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Patricio. Uh, the involvement of World Bank in this is critical. So thank you for all your support in the past and we look forward to working with you in future. Uh, Humberto Maldonado, Health Ministry of Peru, are you here? Thank you. Uh, well, uh, I was thinking about, um, uh, I work in the Ministry of Health of Peru, um, a, a country that is in the middle of a, a process of reforming her, uh, its mental health care system. Um, well, I, I am leaving this uh, conference with a lot of learning experience uh, that I'm, in behalf of the Ministry of Health Peru, like to commit to continue with this process with some uh, uh, learning ideas, like develop the, the necessary evidence in our country of the programs that we've been developing, but with more participation of the the community and the community of users primarily. Experiences uh, like Fountain House uh, has been uh, very um, very informative for me because um, I think that Fountain House work, it's an example of how community isn't like a goal, it's a way of doing things. So I think that this idea has to uh, guide the developing of research, policy making and um, networking also. And the other thing uh, I, I wanted to say that it's that in this process of reform, I will be committed to, uh, with the team in Peru, in, in the Ministry of Health, to develop more spaces like this, in contrast with the academics, uh, the policy makers, and the users, where everyone can uh, contribute to the construction of political, uh, po the, of public policies. Uh, Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. Your participation as well as your continued work is extremely important. We go to another country in the same region, that is Chile, and the person who represents them here is Matthias Errarazabal. Are you still here? <laughs> Perhaps not. Okay. So we move on, and we have Kel Kura from United for Global Mental Health. Kel. Hi, thank you very much. Kel Kerr from United for Global Mental Health, a relatively new actor on the stage. We're looking at the global level and a national level to help catalyze uh, more, uh, greater finances, greater agenda, and uh, greater frameworks for action on mental health. Over the next kind of year, 12 months, we're gonna work and commit to creating greater spaces and joint collaborations. We see uh, a joint narratives and a joint way of a policy asked at the global level to help uh, drive the agenda, what we have been working on the last uh, 12 months. And we'll continue to do this in key events coming over the next uh, 12 months at Davos, at the uh, World Health Assembly, ANGA, the UK summit in, uh, sorry, not the UK summit, it's the Dutch summit uh, in October and then World Mental Health Day. And at the same time, we're also looking to work with uh, a number of low uh, middle income countries and developed countries to create campaigns to as uh, our colleagues here have said, create more momentum, more action at the national level. Uh, as Shekhar has said, lift up uh, the voices of lived experience in countries, create connections between the global and the local levels, and use those campaigns to, really to, to advance uh, action at the national level, as well as help uh, deliver more action at the global level. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kel. I have the name of uh, Laura Magrath from Welcome Trust, but I believe she's not in the room, but I didn't want to just pass over. Laura, are you here? It seems no. So we move on to Virginia Smith Swintowski from JNJ. Virginia. Hi. Um, so I didn't know that my name was on that list, but I'm happy to talk about the things that we're doing. <laughs> um, and I'm happy to say that um, over this next couple of years, we're, we are committed to working on building a um, affordable and scalable model of mental health care specifically focused on schizophrenia uh, for low and middle income countries. And that is our near term focus. So. Um, we hope that those will be great lessons learned that we can apply to, to other resource-limited settings. Thank you very much. We have uh, Dr. Jeffrey Reed, uh, who works at Columbia, but is also responsible for the WHO project uh, on ICD. Jeff, I know that uh, Kathy has already talked about it, but you are the person who manages it. So. What's your commitment? So uh, it, I guess in addition, the ICD for um, people who don't speak acronym is the International Classification of Diseases and Related Health Conditions. And it's the system that WHO member states use to report morbidity and mortality statistics to WHO. And then many countries also use it as a part of the framework for deciding or for defining their obligation to provide free or subsidized health services to their populations. And so it's tremendously important in terms of its function as an information system, but also as a vehicle for um, public health in, in, so that we all speak the same language. And I think there are, um, for whatever reason, which has been powerful and somewhat mysterious to me, it, it attracts tremendous interest and tremendous support. The network that Kathy mentioned of having 15,000 people, or people that signed up to be, from 155 countries who signed up to be part of WHO field studies that we were doing, and it's a response that's beyond any possible uh, a level that I had imagined. Um, we've had great support from the World Psychiatric Association, from uh, the International Union of Psychological Sciences, from many professional associations around the world. It's been very important. I think um, what the ICD gives us, because we will now shift, the, we expect that the final system will be approved by the World Health Assembly at its next meeting in, in uh, May 2019. And there are some 
really fairly radically different concepts that are part of the ICD-11 that I think are dramatic improvements over the ICD-10 that are consistent with um, things that we've discussed at this meeting. I think this will provide us with a way to help member states consider how they might need to change their systems and their practices in, in light of um, the new classificatory practices. Just two quick examples. One example um, that's not about, uh, specifically not about serious mental illness is that in the new ICD-11, um, being transgender is no longer considered to be a mental disorder. And so countries will need to think about, well, you know, then if that's the case, how does that change our eligibility requirements? How does that change the legal procedures that are necessary for people to, to change their gender identity? And how do we create uh, pathways for care that are not, not necessarily psychiatrically based? How do we create uh, treatment opportunities in, in, in more diverse and lower levels of care? Another example is um, the classification of primary psychotic disorders, where the classification is much more focused on what is the person's current status, and it's not on a label that it's expected for the person to carry throughout their lives. And so then you need to think about how do you assess current status and how you assess different types of symptoms. And if you think that cognitive symptoms are important, what might you do to, to be able to um, improve people's status with regard to cognitive symptoms. So it opens up a whole discussion that I think we can begin to have with member states and with multiple constituencies about how we need to change practices because it's a, a, a information system that everyone is gonna have to use. Thanks. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Beverly Ping Pringle from NIMH USA. Beverly, are you here? Yes, see there, right oh, that's the back. No, that's not, no. No? No. no. Okay, so uh, this is the end of my list, but we also circulated this question on the conference app, and a number of you have actually taken the trouble of, of writing your response, and I have uh, requested, and uh, the conference organizers have assembled these uh, uh, these commitments and these thoughts which have come together. So uh, this is what people felt about it and mostly I see that they are very positive. People benefited by, by this conference and all the deliberations and they got new ideas. They are thinking about new activities and they are going back energized. And uh, next please. These will all be available on the app uh, in future. So I don't want to spend too much time you reading that, but just to give an idea that a number of people uh, thought about it and have uh, responded to the question that was asked. Next. I think this is the last one. Thank you. So now, we come back to you. If you haven't spoken, if you haven't written, here's the chance to say your, your commitment. Any one of you. Thanks, Shekhar. I, I'm Alex Cohen. Um, I have a question for everybody and a challenge. How many schools of public health in the world have degrees in global mental health? Department of Psychiatry, Kathy. School of Public Health, okay. But how many? <laughs> it, it's a very, very small number. Um, Otis, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, Johns Hopkins. Columbia. And Columbia, well you raise your hand. <laughs> um, so the challenge is, if you want to expand this field, get schools of public health to take it up. Schools of public health have expanded the health of the world in all conditions. And to keep this confined to clinical um, pursuits is to miss the point. And I think that gets to what we've been talking about in integration. But um, it's shocking 
to me that so few schools of public health have taken this up. Thank you very much, Alex, for uh, alerting us to this, uh, this big deficiency. And I think your point is extremely well taken. Hi. Yes, 